So next we have uh, a guy who's into bugs, a guy who's into insects. You might feel the creepiness coming on stage very soon. Next we got a guy who never gets lonely and sad, because his home is the insect lab at the Smithsonian. He lets flies lay eggs under his skin for research, so he's the only man on earth who's ever given birth. But he never complains with profanity. You might find him crawling through a rainforest canopy or catching poisonous frogs in the tropics. But hey, that's the life of a myrmecologist. So put your hands together for the strangest biologist on earth. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Dr. Mark Moffat. Mark Moffat, everybody, and his little friend. Oh, oh, yes. I was born an adventurer. <laughs> Let me explain. Oop. Oh, I started off in diapers down there where the adventures were with those acorns in the dirt. And then, a few years passed, I started to climb trees, a great place to escape parents and learn about nature. How many people here have climbed a tree or two? Excellent. <laughs> trees are the place to be, and down in the dirt is the place to be. And as I got older, I realized those childhood ways of looking at the world were still useful to me. And so I continued to do both. And I eventually got a, a doctorate in ant myrmecology, the study of ants. And I did a book last year about my adventures among the ants, tracking ants all over the world. And uh, my parents are amazed that this, this can be called a job because this is what I was doing in diapers. What's going on there? But ants are so cool. I knew that as a child. You know, ants do all the things we do. It's, it's really amazing. In fact, ants um, are much more like modern people than we are like chimpanzees. What chimpanzee has to work, worry about public health issues, highways and traffic rules, warfare and slavery? Ants do all these things. And uh, they also have division of labor. They have jobs. So here's a picture of the species I worked on for my dissertation, the marauder ants in India. And you see on the top of the big ant, a little ant. Uh, the big ant weighs about 500 times as much as the little one. And you know, in humans, you can usually walk down the streets of New York and see that, well, this guy's wearing a construction hat and a orange vest, and that guy has this a suit and a briefcase, and guess what their jobs are? In many kinds of ants, you can do the same thing by looking at their size and shape. These worker ants are built to do certain jobs. Well, why would you build such a huge version of yourself? There's a big one there. There's actually a number of sizes in between. It turns out the big ones have a number of jobs in the marauder ant colonies. One job that's a little unusual is they serve as school buses for the small ones, here's about a dozen small ones. Uh, unfortunately, they're not being taken to school, they're being taken to the battlefront. Uh, they are in war, as ants often are. And uh, ants, in fact, I've been studying warfare in ants for a while. They've come up with many of the strategies of human warfare, just about anything you can think of. Uh, there's even a suicide bomber ant in Borneo. This ant is the orangish one here, and it actually walks up to the enemy and explodes. In this case, spewing out a toxic yellow glue, which kills both of them in a tableau, as you see here. Now, ants like this, they're up in the treetops. Lots of the cool things in nature are over our heads. So, you know, that childhood ambition, that adventure spirit of me when I was a kid, came to play again. I started to climb trees again. And uh, that's become part of my life for the last years. I did a book on these explorations. And uh, what lives up there is basically like New York. You have all these layers of branches and trees. And it's like a city. 
thousands and thousands of species live in this city. You can look at it from any number of angles. Uh, you can climb the trees in any number of ways. This is a tower erected by NASA in Costa Rica. It extends well above the treetops. You see the canopy down below. The researchers are there. This is a fisheye lens view, so you see the horizon all around, and I'll leave it to you to figure out how I didn't get my toes in this picture, but it made Jeff down below me very nervous. You can climb sometimes without any much of any help at all. This is my friend Jack Longino. We're down in Costa Rica. Jack's a fellow ant nerd. And uh, we started to climb to the top of a huge ficus tree, a fig tree. And we got near the top and we said, well, why don't we just keep going? And we climbed all the way to the topmost twigs and we're here, Jack is clinging to those twigs as the branches under him are doing this. He's looking like an Easter Island monolith, right? Uh, meanwhile, I'm even more foolish. I'm holding a camera in one hand instead of clutching the trees. But look at the canopy surface, all the leaves, the upper face of the forest is where the photosynthesis largely occurs, where all the energy and nutrients are moving through the forest first. You can use some really fun ways of getting in the trees and doing these kinds of studies. The French have developed the Radu de Seams, the French canopy raft. This is a series of pontoons thrown out over the treetops with uh, a, a, a kind of a trampoline between them. So you just bounce around from tree to tree, in this case, collecting information on insects. You can take it to any extreme you want. I've climbed with Steve Sillett out in California. Steve likes redwoods and sequoias. We climbed a 360-foot tree that uh, got into the Guinness Book of World's Records. He's since found even taller trees. Now, up there is where my passion is because the animals are so cool. They can be all kinds of animals. Sometimes I even look at a vertebrate. It's all right, they're big. They're a little clumsy at their size, but they're cool. Uh, here I was down in Colombia with the spectacled bears. This is the world's only canopy bear, a tree climbing bear. I'm photographing the mother. I, I shimmy up a tree to take a picture, this picture here. And she's like looking around for epiphytes, little canopy plants that she eats. And uh, I sense my branch start to wave back and forth and then it starts to creak and sounds like it might break and I look down and her cub had come up my tree and was batting at my foot. <laughs> and uh, I recall this is an endangered species, so I wasn't sure what I was allowed to do. I didn't think I could kick it, so I started waving my foot at it. And uh, the mother looks across and roars. And she comes straight at me. I don't know how they can do that in the tops of the tree, but she's just coming at me through the branches. Luckily, the cub was more terrified than I was, and the cub took off, and the mother left me alone. So the animals up there, very cool. I pursued my childhood favorites. My expertise in is, is on ants, but I had those favorite things when I was first an explorer down there in diapers or growing up in the trees, and those included frogs. In the tops of trees, you can have some fantastic frogs. You have gliding frogs, uh, frogs that spread their wings, not their wings, but their feet like wings, and they can actually glide in the next tree to escape predators. Here's one here. And so over the course of time, as I explore around the world, this one is in Vietnam, I look for things that are unexpected or different. Frogs are a favorite, so I've gone after the world's Smallest frog. Okay, smallest doesn't impress people so much, so the world's largest frog may be more fun. <laughs> These two boys actually caught the frog. This frog uh, can jump more than 20 feet. And uh, eh, six and a half pounds, what can you do? The record's over seven pounds, 7.1. Maybe it's grown up, it's got a couple years to grow. Maybe I should go back. Okay, frogs again, perhaps my favorite of all time, the dancing frog, little known. It is down in Brazil. It has a curious dance that we'll attempt to demonstrate. Uh, what you do is you lift your hand on one side and wiggle the toes on the opposite side. You can try this at home. It's uh, John Travolta. There's a guy named John Travolta who did something like this. And you go like, like this, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. 
And the female frog, while I was doing this, was so excited that she hopped up on my shoulder and watched the male continue his dance. The world's deadliest frog. This is one I talked about last year in the World Science Festival. The, this frog is so toxic you can die just from touching it. You can see from the attitude of the frog. It's literally, it's in a very remote place in Colombia. It will just walk up to you and go, come on, touch me. What's, what's the problem? Touch me. And uh, you have to remember it's a deadly frog. The Indians there use the frogs on their blow darts. You touch the dart, a sharpened stick, to the back of the frog, and it's good for a year. This particular Embora Choco Indian uh, was trying to be macho, I believe, and touched the frog, held down the frog with his finger, and his whole arm went numb, but he was okay. Now, it was great to visit that village, except for one thing. They had a very playful way of doing things, and they invented a game. And the game was, why don't we shoot darts right at the funny foreign-looking guy, but just barely miss him each time. <laughs> this game is good for, you know, seven seconds, maybe. <laughs> I have developed into a storyteller, and that's my message here. Go out and find stories. It's a frog, it's an ant. Learn about them as a scientist, as a journalist, any way you like. Find the stories that you love. And uh, sometimes the stories find you, though. In this case, this is a cartoon that appeared in National Geographic. Uh, I was walking along with my friend Doug in Peru, and I was exhausted, so I just plopped on the ground, and Doug looked over and started screaming at me. And it turned out I had sat on the most deadly snake in the New World, uh, the Fair de Lance. Now, if this happens to you, I recommend this sit directly on top of its head. <laughs> this is the only way to sit on a deadly snake. <laughs> I have tracked down snakes on Snake Island, also in Brazil. The other, the other snake was in Peru. This uh, is an island covered with more deadly snakes than in any other place on Earth. There are, there's one snake every two square yards, and their poison has to work really fast because uh, if they bite a seabird, which is what they eat, and the bird flies two yards, the next snake gets it. <laughs> so I was on an expedition with this man, Joe Slowinski, a few years ago in 2001, and Joe studies snakes, an extraordinary scientist who was willing, he loves snakes, and he was willing to take risks to find new species and what they did. And unfortunately, the day after this picture was taken, Joe was bitten by a little snake called the crate. If you read Ricky Ticky Tava in the Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling, you know about the crate. It's more deadly than the cobra. And Joe died 24 hours later. And while he was lying there, we all still realized one important thing. He still loved snakes. And this is the essential thing to remember. If you love something, you have to take risks. This is the essence of loving anything. And if you're gonna allow nature in this world, you have to allow for the possibility of snakes in the forests and sharks near our beaches. And so we all look around the world and take the risks that we need to take to get our stories, to get to learn what we need to learn. My favorite place to go is the Tapuis of Venezuela. These are the flat top mountains that were made famous by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in The Lost World. This one is about a half mile tall. Sir Arthur and Conan Doyle thought they were so remote and so inaccessible that dinosaurs could live on top of them. And in fact, I traveled down there working with an explorer named Charles Brewer, a Venezuelan, and he's found thousands of new species. And these are places worth taking the risk. One of our last trips was to descend, descend about a quarter mile deep in a sinkhole. This is looking up uh, at the sky. And in the shaded depths of that hole, there's a forest hidden from the rest of the world. And there, there's Charles at night with a uh, torch that he's made from tree sap. Charles is a real uh, a solid adventure person. He doesn't need to bring a hammock with him. He makes his hammock. <laughs> and there we found, in the bottom of this hole, hidden from the rest of the world, 
a number of new species, including this frog, Colostethus moffati, named after me. <laughs> Whoa! It's, it's the rocket frog. And my message to you is this. There are new species and wonders to find out there. The world has not been all explored. You can go to places like Venezuela and be on the top of a tapui like this where no human being has yet been. And this particular tapui is like, it's like being on the asteroid with the little prince. Remember that uh, story? The little prince and his asteroid. That's, that's where his rose would be. And indeed the flowers and the, and the new species up there are amazing. You can drop a boulder off the edge of that cliff and you will never hear it fall. It's a half mile straight down. So find your stories, find your adventures. Uh, we were all born adventurers, we've just forgotten it. And those adventures could be everywhere in our lives. Here, for example, is my wedding to the amazing Melissa Wells. <laughs> we had a wedding um, that's on Easter Island at the top of the volcano, the first traditional wedding in 50 years. And uh, it's an adventure that continues our lives. Find your own adventures and go with them. Thanks for coming tonight.